guests, thank you for joining us. My name is Shamini Salvaratnam, and I will be your MC for this event. Today is the energy transition theme at the High Level Energy Dialogue Ministerial Forum. Our side event, Financing Energy Projects in Small Island Developing States, is timely and critical, which is why the Climate Investment Platform is co-hosting it with the Bureau of Small Islands, Bureau of the Alliance of Small Island States. The Climate Investment Platform was launched at the Climate Action Summit in 2019. It is a partnership of the United Nations Development Program, the International Renewable Energy Agency, the Sustainable Energy for All, in coordination with the Green Climate Fund. The platform supports countries to unlock capital from climate action and clean energy deployment. To start the session, I would like to extend the floor to His Excellency, Dr. Walton Webson, Permanent Representative of Antigua and Barbuda to the United Nations and the Chair of the Alliance of Small Island States. Ambassador Webson has been Permanent Representative since 2014 in 2017, he was the chair of UNICEF. He is also the most recent president emeritus of the UNDP Executive Board. His Excellency, the floor is yours. Excellencies and colleagues, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this webinar. EOSIS is co-organizing with the Climate Investment Platform. Focusing on financing energy projects in small island developing states. Colleagues, small island developing states are fully committed to transforming our energy sector while maintaining social and economic equity in our communities. These commitments are reflected in our ambitious nationally determined contributions, including those that aim for net neutrality by 2030. Several SIDS, my friends, are also aiming for 100% renewable energy in the very near future. Deploying renewable energy will strengthen our, our resilience against the adverse impact of climate change if energy systems are distributed and grid interactive and keeping us on track on our sustainable development pathway. We also recognize renewable energy's potential to help stimulate economies through new jobs and um, spin-off industries. Reducing fiscal burden from fossil fuel imports and enhancing SID's ability to cope with shocks. Colleagues, there are, however, several obstacles to the energy transformation in SIDS. Let's look at some. One, SIDS have a high landed cost of technology that can be um, roughly three times that of major economies, which is a burden in itself to climate technology transfer. High costs are compounded by eligib eligibility rules around GDP per capita, which should instead accommodate the special circumstances of SIDS. Two, the shortfall of public and private capital investment at the scale is a key barrier. Over 10 years ago, it was agreed that wealthy countries would mobilize $100 billion per year in climate finance by 2020. This commitment is yet to be, to be completed. It's yet to happen. Broader system changes are needed to minimize bureaucracy and simplify access to finance for a rapid energy transformation. Another barrier, or you might say the third, is the continued 
subsidization and transferring of fossil fuel technology while channeling more climate finance. We also need safeguards in place to prevent major economies from cheaply offloading, let's say soon to be out of date technologies, including things like liquid natural gas energy engines to SIDS and other emerging economies. We must prevent global emission transfers and leakages, and instead leave no one behind in the clean energy transition. My friends, AOSIS is committed to employing innovative ways to enhance investment by enabling risk sharing between private and inve private investment and public funding through blending finance and by providing more direct access to climate finance for our local private business businesses we believe in the job opportunities that a just transition of the workforce can deliver Still, friends, some progress has been made over the last several years. Our collective approach to, renew to renewable energy development in SIDS should be designed with these barriers noted above in mind. If we are to scale up and enhance development to achieve our fast approaching targets, we in AOSIS hope this discussion today will stimulate concrete action by policymakers and investors to enable SIDS to fully harness our, our, our renewable energy potential. I therefore look forward to hearing from the distinguished panel this morning and look forward to a very lively and informative conversation. I thank you. Thank you, Excellency Dr. Gibson, for setting the tone for this event with your welcome remarks. We have an excellent panel covering the various regions of the SIDS. To moderate the panel, I would like to invite His Excellency Dr. Martin Herman, Ambassador and Permanent Representative of Denmark to the United Nations. He is no stranger to the SIDS. Prior to his UN appointment, he served as the Ambassador to Indonesia and was also accredited to East Timor and Papua New Guinea. He's also held several roles in the Danish Foreign Ministry, including the State Secretary for Development Policy and Head of Department for Asia and Pacific Region. Ambassador Herman, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shamini. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody uh, out there. I suppose one of the results of COVID-19 is that we are all able to, to meet across, uh, across different time zones. One of the sort of, one of the accelerations of new technology that we hadn't seen coming, but I suppose, which is in, in, in some ways a welcome uh, side effect of COVID-19. One of the so much so welcome side effect, at least for my part, is that I have to look at myself on screen. So, so excuse me while I try to sort of minimize the uh, myself. No? But uh, colleagues, uh, welcome to uh, what is going to be a really, really interesting panel about what is a really sort of innovative uh, thing, because the climate investment platform is itself quite an, an innovative uh, thing, a partnership between uh, IRENA, UNDP, uh, the Green uh, Climate Fund and Sustainable Energy for All, set up in the aftermath of the Climate Action Summit back in 2019. It tries to focus on on uh, on some of the things that my good friend Aubrey uh, mentioned at the beginning. How do you actually get the uh, money flowing? No, uh, money uh, money matches. It also matches on the energy transition. We have an amazing panel uh, for you uh, this morning to to talk about uh, some of the challenges, but also some of the opportunities, some of the ways that we can advance this agenda. Now, I will introduce the panel as I ask them to uh, to uh, to take the floor. We have four uh, amazing panelists and looking at the 
at their screen, uh, I'm going to introduce sort of a little competition, that is who has the greatest background. And I must say that Charles is, is, uh, is leading uh, by quite a margin uh, at, at the moment, uh, Charles, with, with the sea and ocean uh, there at the, at the background. But we will, uh, we will kick off uh, with a, a very, very good friend of mine, uh, Dr. Sachendra uh, Prasad, uh, who is uh, the ambassador and permanent representative of Fiji here to the United Nations uh, in, in New York, but he's also uh, chair of the Pacific Small Island States uh, uh, in 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 New York, and and, and is a is a leader, uh, is a is a standard bearer uh, when actually comes to highlighting not only some of the challenges that the small island developing states uh, faces, but actually also uh, some of the solutions uh, that that we need to uh, to uh, to engineer that we need to to get in in motion. Uh, Sajendra has uh, experience uh, both from the World Bank and from uh, from uh, Department for International Development, UK's uh, since then uh, merged uh, Department for International Development uh, Corporation. He has a long uh, academic background. I'm not going to uh, read out to, to you. Then we will be spending too much uh, time on this. But but Sajendra, can can I ask you to uh, to kick up kick us off, and then we will move on to uh, to uh, to Leslie, to to Charles, and to Paul. But Sajendra, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Martin, and uh, good, uh, good morning, good evening to uh, uh, everyone who's logged in. It, and uh, very difficult, uh, as you know, Martin, to follow my dear friend, Ambassador Webson, but uh, he's, uh, I think, laid the, the, uh, the framework uh, beautifully. I presume I have about three minutes, uh, so I'll try to uh, come, come to the point. Uh, uh, first, uh, for many SIDS, uh, when they're talking about energy transition, often, uh, you will have uh, in a energy transition, a meeting between a SITS expert, one or two, and uh, financial institutions who are potentially interested in uh, energy, renewable energy investment, et cetera. And the mismatch goes something like this, that the representative of the financial institution uh, may have done 100, 250, uh, some number of energy projects, and the representative of SITS, most likely this is the first uh, uh, energy transition or, or renewable energy investment uh, project that they're dealing with. And that mismatch is, uh, says so much about, uh, about SITS uh, generally. And that uh, then uh, transposes, I'm saying it at very general level, very uneven across many countries uh, on, on the choices of financing instruments, uh, uh, knowledge about financing instruments that are available, uh, how to access and leverage uh, different, uh, uh, and often also, in uh, a lack of understanding of what is in the best interest of uh, the small island states. And I say this in a very genuine uh, way because they are across the uh, SIDS, uh, they are possibly already uh, more failed energy transition projects than more successful in the whole, whole stock of it. And it, it's quite, quite glary. And I must say to UNDP, thank you very much for this uh, initiative, but uh, uh, it is possible that parts of the UN have also been involved in, in the advice that have led to the number of failed programs. So we are dealing with something very substantial. Second is, uh, uh, you know, uh, SIT space, uh, all sorts of uh, uh, disadvantages. And one of the disadvantages they are beginning with uh, in what is possibly one of the more expensive uh, uh, investment areas uh, is that they already have a very high uh, debt to GDP uh, exposure. They're amongst the most uh, uh, exposed uh, countries in the world. So this is a significant addition to their debt uh, burden, and uh, they're coming into it from that disadvantage. And third is something that financial institutions have a lot of difficulty with. By the very nature, it's a small countries, uh, uh, small populations, and therefore small markets, and uh, they've not been so attractive to uh, private sector investment. So the state or governments will play a disproportionate role. They probably own large part of the electricity uh, uh, companies uh, or probably own them fully in, in the many majority of countries, I would say. And uh, that type of thing, financial institutions have a lot of difficulty with. And this is uh, uh, against this backdrop, then we need to be uh, having this conversation. And Mr. Webson has laid out uh, one of the important parts about de-risking very well. And that is, you know, where are, uh, are then those type of resources through which small states with limited capacity and, and a very large uh, reach 
can begin to look at. So uh, right now, they're uh, probably locked in GCF, which is underfunded, the 100 billion commitment is not there. Uh, they are locked in uh, uh, multilateral institutions such as uh, World Bank, African Development Bank, uh, but the grant component of that is very small and under-resourced. Under and in any case, small states cannot uh, ex uh, access the grant components, many of them, uh, because they're middle or high middle income. Uh, country. So even those that are successful pay a price for, uh, for their success by being uh, denied uh, uh, that, uh, that resources. So uh, we need to uh, think of a combination, I, I would say, uh, of, uh, of, of areas. One part would be to substantially uh, beef up uh, the financial resources that are available in agencies such as uh, uh, GCF, uh, which can provide the grant component through which much of the design and technical work uh, 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 can take place uh, that can then uh, be used to leverage and, and open uh, innovative uh, private sector type of partnerships. That's one. Second is to uh, look at the long-term financing, uh, low cost, low interest financing instruments that are available via the Asian Development Bank or the African Development Bank and other multilateral uh, institutions uh, that uh, uh, the SITs should be able to access energy transition type of investments on very low concessional rates, regardless of their level of income. And because their market size is uh, small, uh, that their repayment should be over extended periods of time. And I've used that term ultra long term financing institutions, uh, 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 financing arrangements. And uh, this uh, 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 we should also be looking at uh, very, uh, very seriously. So uh, uh, these are my uh, two remarks, uh, a combination of uh, technical investments, uh, a combination of leveraging, uh, de-risking and leveraging instru uh, instruments, and uh, a unified and coherent support through IRENA and the, and the uh, UNDP and the specialist agencies at the, uh, with the level of sophistication that is needed, uh, we, we will be able to get over the line uh, in this. If we do not, uh, bring all these pieces together. My own uh, suspicion is that uh, end of the decade, you might find that the small island states are the states that are most left behind in the en energy transition. Uh, it, would, uh, it would be you know, quite unfortunate that the countries who have given so much uh, for climate diplomacy and, uh, and for bringing international attention on, on climate action are the ones who will uh, suffer most because they are unable to uh, open up and leverage uh, uh, the uh, the type of financing instruments and uh, mechanisms that can work for them. So I thank you very much, uh, Martin, for getting me on this panel, and thank you very much. Uh, for well, thank you, th thank you so much, uh, Satyendra, uh, also for sort of highlighting that, that 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 part of the solutions here is to recognize that that uh, that small island developing states, and when it comes to to the energy transition and climate, are are unusual uh, unusual entities that find themselves in unusual situations. So. Uh, so more business as usual is not necessarily going to uh, cut it. But let's let's uh, let's try and hit from somebody who's in the in the business uh, as as it as it were. Uh, to Leslie uh, Bierman Lam. Leslie is uh, is the representative in, in North in the North American representative uh, office of the Asian Development uh, Bank. Uh, Leslie's been working with with ADB for 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 almost a decade, but at least since 2002. No, Leslie, uh, including as senior advisor to the to the vice president, but also as a leader of of strategy and, and, and policy development coordination for key strategic and, and institutional um, uh, consideration, including leading uh, ADP's uh, uh, participation in, in G20 uh, activities, and importantly for this discussion, also chairing actually the Bended uh, Finance uh, Committee. Uh, in, in her current role, uh, uh, Leslie is part of mobilizing uh, financing and, and support for, for ADP's uh, member, uh, member countries. Uh, and is part of uh, an, an, an effort to share to share uh, development knowledge and experience some of the asymmetry that that Prasir, uh, that Sachendra uh, talked about. So, uh, so Leslie, uh, over to you for uh, for a few uh, opening remarks before we get into a Q and A. Great, thank you so much, and thank you for um, setting the stage. Actually, for my for my opening remarks, um, I just wanted to uh, thank the previous speakers actually for highlighting that really what our role as a multilateral development bank is to help overcome the constraints 
um, to access to finance um, and simplify that access to finance. Um, of just of ADB, to set a little bit of the context, of ADB's 68 member shareholders, 49 are from Asia and the Pacific, and 16 um, identify as SIDS. So under our strategy 2030, uh, a significant thrust is to increase our support for the low carbon transition uh, with integrated climate and disaster really resilience investments. And as noted previously, we do recognize that development efforts have to be tailored to meet local and specific circumstances. And as such, we apply a differentiated approach um, to our various developing member countries. Um, as His Excellency noted, most Pacific SIDS have set targets of reaching up to 100% of renewable electricity generation by 2030. Um, this transition will not be simple, and I think we all appreciate that. Uh, most of the SIDS lack the technical capability to switch from a single source generation system and energy transition is expensive. Um, and funding is needed from both a combination of public and private sor sources to support these goals. So what is ADB doing? Um, we're looking at applying a very flexible strategy and we're considering smaller and higher risk transactions using a combination of um, blended finance, technical assistance, a number of de-risking tools and innovative financing structures. And we also recognize that energy sector restructuring is required. So ADB is supporting sector reforms to mainstream renewable energy. And we're also looking at innovative ways to leverage private sector investment in revenue generating projects. So just to give one example of our activities in this area, um, we have something called the Pacific Renewable Energy Program or PREP for short. And that's a private sector financing facility of $100 million um, intended to minimize the risks in developing renewable energy projects, as well as encourage private sector investment in the SIDS. The program provides a credit enhancement structure to support the credit worthiness of power utilities where governments are no longer willing or otherwise able to, off, uh, to guarantee the offtake obligations. Um, PREP offers a combination of a partial risk guarantee, direct loans, and technical assistance. And there is a donor-backed letter of credit, which covers short-term liquidity risks, supporting up to 24 months of power payments under the PPA. Uh, this package is offered during project preparation, which and this allows developers to require a lower rate of return in their bid based on the improved risk profile of the project, resulting in a lower proposed tariff. Um, under this program, ADB is preparing to finance a six megawatt solar power project in Tonga. Um, that is, uh, the donor in that particular project is uh, the government of New Zealand. Um, ADB is also developing floating solar projects to implement marine renewable technologies. Um, and just to end with a little food for thought, and I think this has been echoed by others, um, given the smaller scale of renewable projects and SIDS, which typically range from the three to $10 million rate, dollar investment range, we really need to consider the appropriateness of applying full-on limited recourse financing structures. Um, it may be worth considering, or I think it is worth considering um, other non-traditional forms of financing to mitigate risks and lead to greater volume of bankable projects. The complexity of security packages and full, pri full project financing structures, which are typically applied for significantly larger transactions in different environments, are very challenging to complete in SIDS for a variety of reasons. So from our, I mean, we need to balance risks. Also, we need to balance the requirements of investors, of course, to find cost-effective solutions to attract private finance but that's appropriate for SIDS and their special circumstances. Thank you very much. I actually have some ideas later, but. <laughs> Fantastic, uh, Liz, thanks also for that cliffhanger. Uh, but uh, but no, uh, very, very interesting. And I suppose in, in particular that sort of perspective of, of what you might, uh, for a layman like me, call sort of a cocktail approach, saying that it's not enough with one ingredient if you actually want to uh, to uh, to resolve this issue. You actually need to, to combine several things. but. Uh, but one of the guys who's actually trying to, to do all of these uh, things uh, from, a, from, a, from a country perspective is, is our next uh, panelist, uh, uh, Charles, Charles de la Rosa, who is the Director of Renewable Energy uh, of the Ministry of Energy and Mines um, of the Dominican uh, Republic. Uh, Charles has held uh, several uh, different technical positions, including as, as project and, 
and development, uh, several project and development roles in, in public and private institutions in the Dominican uh, Republic, and actually uh, across Central America. Also been an advisor on, on renewable energy projects for, uh, for the German Agency for Development Corporation, GIC, in, in the CARICOM uh, countries. But uh, so Charles, uh, apart from an amazing background, uh, looking very much forward to hear what, uh, what you have to bring to us uh, this, uh, this morning, uh, the floor is yours. Um, thank you very much, um, and um, I will do a, a short remarks of uh, our ministry uh, to you have to all have an idea what is uh, our, our works and our purpose for this. The Ministry of Energy and Mines is a dependency of the President of the Dominican Republic, an organism created by the law 113 in 2013. Our ministry had uh, only eight years uh, uh, ago. And uh, in this AG, we have to do a lot, a lot of words in the, in the short time. For the purpose of being the organ of the public administration dependent of the executive power uh, in charge of formulation and administration of the national energy and mining policy. Uh, the Ministry of Energy and Mines in this capacity must to govern the body of the system responsible uh, for the formulation, um, adoption, monitoring, uh, evaluation, control of policies, uh, strategies, general plans, programs, uh, projects, and services related to the energy sector and its energy subsectors, renewable energy, um, nuclear energy, natural gas, and mining. Um, one of the ministry's success story cases uh, is the implementation and adaptation of fiscal policy for the benefit of equipment and material for the development and construction of uh, renewable energy projects in the country. Uh, that is uh, our show remarks and we will do some other information more ahead. And uh, thank you in advance for the opportunity and the invitation as panelists in this webinar. Thank you. Charles, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, also for putting sort of a spotlight that there are so many uh, practical and often sort of you know, quite complicated uh, procedures involved in actually getting these things up and running. These, these are so difficult to take from what you might, from concepts on PowerPoint presentations down to down to the actual uh, reality and, 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 and producing uh, producing what needed. Now, I think it's sort of increasingly been recognized that all of these things are not really, really going to happen unless we, we get the private sector involved. So I'm really delighted that our next panelist is a representative of exactly uh, that, uh, Paul Macumba, who is the founder uh, and Chief uh, Executive Officer of Sonagize. I hope I got that right, Paul, otherwise please uh, uh, correct me. Uh, but that's a company uh, that actually provides clean, reliable and cost-effective solar power services, uh, not only for businesses, but actually for communities and, and government. Uh, Paul has extensive uh, senior leadership experience uh, across the Australian, New Zealand and, and Pacific Island uh, market. So uh, Paul, look forward to hearing uh, from your perspective, teach us how to turn on the switch. Thank you so much, Martin. And uh, you know, to all the speakers that have gone before me, thank you so much for setting the scene. Um, you know, it's a pleasure to do one of these again. I think I've done a number. Uh, Sunnygize has been around for nine years now, and we've had um, the experience of effectively having IFC as an initial shareholder when we first started, and then moving from you know, um, having World Bank IFC backing to bring on private sector institutional investors such as Todd Corporation to try and effectively roll out renewables across the Pacific. Uh, we've been working for nine years and we've done projects from rural electrification, corporate CNI, and now working with uh, Tonga Power and soon Fiji Electrical to uh, roll out utility scale uh, projects. So, in a sense, you know everything that um, the previous panelists have spoken about, we've been living and breathing and trying to find the solutions from a private sector perspective to try and accelerate uh, renewable technologies in, um, in the Pacific. Um, this particular topic is, uh, you know, is very close to my heart because as I said, when we first started, um, it was private capital, then augmented with, um, uh, IFC World Bank, and when we got to a stage where they could not continue to support, we brought on institutional 
investors. And we've worked with financiers, uh, the problems that uh, have been identified in terms of, um, uh, you know, security required, length of tenure. And right now we've just gone through a process for the six megawatt solar farm where, you know, um, the process and the design of, um, you know, um, project financing is overlaid onto a six megawatt solar farm. That just doesn't work. You know, I can tell you, um, if we look at the cost, just the transactional cost of doing that project alone. Um, and, you know, the funny thing is that whatever we've done in that project, is actually not transferable to any other projects because of different regulatory environments, different uh, jurisdictions. So we effectively burn in quite a lot of money, which saddles the people who really need the power. So I think that, you know, as I said, I've done a number of these over the last nine years. I'm hoping that we're going to get to a point where we're not doing these to discuss problems, but we're starting to discuss our successes more. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, also for sort of in very concrete terms, also putting sort of the, the spot on one of the things that I think Sajendra also mentioned, this thing that what you might call the cost of the lack of scale, you know? yeah. that the transaction cost becomes prohibitively high uh, and definitely not a fit into our sort of classical classical way of, of, uh, of looking at things. But I also want to be sorry about how you, you might sort of say that you've moved through the different, um, let's say, different phases on, of the spectrum of blended finance. You know? Uh, from from blending private with with public uh, from uh, from uh, into institutional uh, investors, uh, but but it's clear that that there are real challenges uh, out there. But I think your story and, and Sonnenjai's story, to some extent, is also the story about that this is actually possible to do. I mean, this is not uh, this is not a hypothetical situation solutions that we are looking at. Now we now we will try to sort of slowly move into the into the Q and A. Uh, you've heard from uh, you you've heard from the. Uh, the, from, from, from two experienced diplomats, the chair of AOSIS, my good friend, uh, Satyendra. Uh, you've heard from, from Leslie, uh, IFI. Uh, we've heard from, from Charles, who is, who is doing the business from a government perspective on the ground, and then from Paul, who is, who is uh, putting all his entrepreneurial skills to, to work. But, but let's find, sort of move into a more interactive uh, part of it, uh, a q and I'll sort of try to kick off with a few questions to, to the panelists and, and ask them to come in, uh, but I also want them to encourage them to, to be as interactive as it's possible to do here over Zoom, uh, unmute, uh, respond to what you hear uh, or the thing. But, but I think, Leslie, perhaps I can start with, with, with you, uh, so we don't do it in exactly the same order, and perhaps to, to ask you to elaborate a little bit on where you see some of the key sort of financial de-risking tools that, that, uh, that are available also when it comes to, to innovate, innovative financial solutions that, that ADB has to offer. And perhaps also, you know, if you could wish, you know, which, which tool would you like to have in your toolbox that you don't have uh, at, at present in order to, uh, to, to provide assistance to, to Charles, to Paul, and to Satyendra and, uh, and Aubrey? Uh, Desti. So which tools are already there and which ones would you like? Yeah, yeah well, <laughs> the wish list is long. Um, I, I agree with Paul completely that you know, it's it's kind of like trying to crack a nut with a sledgehammer to do a full-on private uh, project finance structure, as I mentioned earlier, for uh, you know a three to ten million dollar deal. It's it, it just it's impractical. Um, so I mean, ADB has uh, several financing products and de-risking tools that are available to our clients. I think that you know your your traditional running the gamut from loans to partial risk guarantees, partial credit guarantees, um, you know, letters of credit, uh, sovereign, you know, a counter sovereign indemnity, which is a great tool. Um, but you know, not all of these. I think the issue is not all of these are are really workable or or appropriate in the SIDS context. Um, you know, low credit worthiness of a power utility may make the cost of financing too great. Um, you know, lack of bankable PPAs, uncertainty about foreign currency and convertibility risk. And I mean, there are a number of risks that obviously need to be overcome. Um, just turning to sort of um, what, what we're doing is I mentioned this prep. I mean, looking to mitigate risk, obviously that that's the key here. Um, 
and and the we we find that the guaranteed LC structure works quite nicely. Um, you know, it's a cash collateralized uh, product, but. Again, um, and also in this instance, we have the utility taking um, the first loss position for the first three months of non-payment. So there's a bit of risk sharing involved as well. Um, but I think, I think fundamentally in SIDS and um, concessional finance is really the key. And that is you know, contingent on there being donors who are willing to provide those concessional resources. Um, and you know, we get to the, the blending um, and, you know, there are a number of solutions that we can employ under a blended finance structure. So this is basically where we have donor funds combined with uh, con normal commercial uh, uh, rate uh, products, which either, you know, can go to lower the interest rate or the sort of a viability gap financing model. Um, our donors recently approved a private sector window, which is 100% grant financing um, to target these blended finance structures um, in, in specifically in fragile and conflict situations, including SIS. It's a very powerful tool. Um, we can use it to um, hedge for forex risk. Um, we can, you know, so which is a, basically a local currency solution. Uh, we can use it similar to prep to guarantee certain risks to upgrade the risk profile in any given project. Um, but I, th I think really going back to the wish list, and this is kind of where we've been thinking a lot in ADB, how can we finance these, these projects with, with, you know, under different structures? And that's what we, we need is a different toolbox, a different sort of set of, set of products. And, and some of the things we've been kind of uh, playing around with is, why not finance it as a corporate loan? And I know that's a bizarre structure given a project finance, you have to disperse on a certain schedule, but maybe you can match your disbursements to the um, to ESG requirements um, and development effectiveness indicators. And that way you have investors who can come in and they meet their ESG requirements through that investment. And I think that's very powerful because you know, you see these investors running around really desperately trying to find viable investments that satisfy those 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 requirements. And those requirements are coming and, you know, it, it, it's 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 a possible way. I mean, we have to match, you know, you have to match the payment schedule. It's, it's sort of a results based lending concept. And if they don't meet the results, maybe the donor comes in and, you know, pays if, if, if those results aren't met. That's one idea. Um, we have a reimbursable TA structure. So you finance the grant up front, and then, you know, as, as the project generates revenues, you pay it back. So basically, you get grant financing up front to finance the, the development costs. And then, you know, when the risk is lower, you start repaying the loan. Um, another way is, so ADB has both sovereign and non-sovereign, so we could perhaps use some non-sovereign resources to prepare these projects, again, and mitigate the risk and make sure they're bankable, because we all know that project preparation is a problem. Um, and, you know, we could have maybe a step, a two-step interest rate. Interest rate at the very beginning is very low, and then once the project is developed, it, it increases, and then then that's when the private sector comes in and assumes the obligations of the government at that stage. So those are just some things. I'm sure there's a lot of ideas out there, but we are really trying actively to find ways to get around the high cost of project finance structures and SIDS for small projects. Well, thank you so much, uh, Leslie. Really, really fascinating. And I suppose, once again, an illustration of the fact that we have a system that's not really uh, designed for this, but, but it's actually possible to... Uh, to tweak, if you like, uh, by the use of different types of uh, facilities and approaches to tweak the system to respond better to this. But but let me turn to Charles, Charles, uh, and ask you a little bit about. I mean, you've you sort of recently announced that, that renewables would would, uh, would account for at least twenty five percent of power generation uh, by twenty thirty in in the Dominican Republic, uh, and and that uh, that power supply uh, auction. Uh, would incorporate renewables, uh, try to incorporate renewables in the grid. Can you talk about sort of some of the instruments that you're trying to, to deploy to address uh, 
uh, to mitigate, if you like, uh, both what you might call perceived, but actually also actual uh, investor risks that, that Leslie was alluding a little bit to. What are you doing in, in concrete terms? Uh, well, um, we are very motivated and are working a lot with, with this all this process. Inclusive, we are now committed to uh, a 30% of power generation by, by 2030. Um, recently, the Ministry of Energy and Mine have informed uh, the working process to modify the regulation of the renewable energy incentive law and um, a development of a protocol. So those new accusations are carried out through tenders. Um, the decision to, to put out to tenders uh, the conception for renewable energy project refers essentially to the purchase contracts, the PPA. So it will not affect the legal process of the request made at the National Energy Commission. Um, in this sense, uh, the typical public instruments that are implemented uh, for renewable energy on a large scale are composed of uh, central instruments, such as uh, fitting tariff, uh, complemented by risk mitigation instruments, and by direct uh, financial incentives where be necessary. In this scenario, uh, risk mitigation can take two basic forms. Measures that reduce uh, risk, uh, let's say political risk mitigation, uh, measures that transfer risk, uh, financial risk mitigation. And uh, within the risk uh, mitigation policy, uh, possible measure can be uh, long-term objective in renewable energy, a streamlined permitting process, um, uh, stable political regime and uh, um, allow the banks that uh, the final conception for a project can be totally or partially transferred to the bank in the event of not compliance by the project developers. Um, um, improve the process of a negotiation of obtaining of PPA between the government and the developer of a renewable energy projects. Um, within the financial risk uh, mitigation, possible measure can be uh, public loans, uh, partial loans, guarantees, uh, political risk insurance, uh, reinforce the payment of invoices made by the government through distributor to generators, um, loan interest rates, and good financing condition for the development of renewable energy projects of national financial entities. Um, in addition to this, we can say that direct financial incentive measure could also be applied, such as uh, preferential price, uh, fit and tariff, uh, PPA, um, tax credits, and uh, carbon credits. Well, that presumes the instruments that are included in the procurement process to mitigate risk, as uh, Les says before. Maybe we have, uh, um, and we will implement uh, another uh, uh, more ideas to, to mitigate this risk and to make the process more smooth and more secure for the investor. Thanks. Thanks, Charles. Fascinating. And I suppose ultimately you could boil it down to a little bit of how you're dealing with risk. There are two ways you can do it. You can try to mitigate them, and then you can try to move them out of the way, basically, or transfer them to, to us. And, and, and both things are, 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 are complicated and, and, and some of them, those actually might also be uh, expensive. Now that was from the perspective of, of government, but, but Paul, can I ask you to sort of briefly give us, um, give us sort of uh, just a, a few examples of, of, uh, of some of the real barriers that you have, that you have uh, encountered also in dealing with, uh, with, with, with governments where you find governments uh, being, if you like, Forced to do things that that were counter to your ability to to uh, to uh, to, uh, to do your business. No, when it comes to providing renewable energy. Yeah. Thanks, Juan. Um, I think one of the you know biggest barriers that we have is the lack of a unified um, you know uh, regulatory platform, so to speak. Uh, you know, I, I talked earlier on about the fact that we're just negotiating. Uh, with ADB for um, a fund for um, for Tonga, we will do the same for Fiji, and we will probably face the same amount of uh, legal costs, you know, which will be added uh, to those projects. 
uh, we operate projects in about seven different Pacific Island countries. And in each one of those, it's a completely different regulatory environment. And that just makes the cost of doing business too expensive. So that's on one end. And then on the other is that you've got on the supply side, if I want to call it that, is the local financial institutions. Um, you know, I think there's a requirement for TA or technical assistance to be given to those local finance uh, institutions to understand the nature of renewable energy projects, to understand how to structure them, not so much in a, you know, uh, in a project finance perspective, but possibly closer to a corporate loan, but without the requirement, you know, for putting up personal guarantees or land, which just makes it incredibly difficult for developers, local developers to participate. And what you end up having is you then end up having international developers who come in, do projects, walk away from them. And to Ambassador Prasad's you know, initial comments, that's why we have so many failed projects. You know, in the 10 years we've been doing business, we, we, we effectively look at ourselves, we, all our staff are based in Fiji. We are a local developer. We've had to go in and fix projects that have been left derelict by international developers. Um, and then thirdly, I would say, um, you know, the blending of private sector finance and um, multilateral finance. I think it's, it is key that that conversation happens not in the same way that um, what you call sovereign relationships are dealt with, but in a different manner in almost like a private sector, you know, uh, partnership manner. I think what we do see when we deal with multilaterals is that, you know, in the same way that project financing um, protocols are given, it's the same when you come to deal with multilaterals, they expect you to have the same um, processes that you would have in a sovereign sector in the government. So I think, you know, if I had one word to give to the participants, the governments, to SIDS, is simplify. It's, that's all I, in 10 years, all I could ask for is a simplified regulatory environment, financing institutions so that we can get on and do the job of rolling out renewable energy. So simplify. Thank you. Thanks. That was really excellent, uh, Paul. Simplify, make things simpler, then you make them cheaper and then you make them happen. No, that's, uh, that's what I take away from that. Sajendra, and before we, we, uh, we turn to the, the closing, things are, uh, time is running much too fast, but just ask you, Sajendra, no, if you, if you had, uh, if, if, what, what to your, in your perspective, is sort of the, the single biggest obstacle for us here in New York in trying to produce the changes uh, that that uh, are needed. If you had uh, if you had one wish when it comes to the international community here at the United Nations in New York, what would it be? Now, what is the single biggest obstacle that we need to get out of the way? Single, single biggest is I, I think the UN simply doesn't get it the level of uh, complexity and difficulty in small states. It is you know very difficult to explain that uh, regulatory uh, transition, however urgent uh, energy transition uh, is, uh, it's something uh, something in the most, uh, even in uh, Denmark may take 10, 12 years and somehow it is expected that in, in SITS we can do that in one year. Uh, that's uh, it's, it's difficult to make, uh, make that case. And I think that uh, disadvantage walks itself uh, through. And uh, finally, uh, if uh, in the General Assembly House we had a uh, level of understanding uh, that uh, the uh, that the weight is disproportionate, uh, the level of uh, climb is too steep for uh, sits, I am quite certain uh, that the grant component and the concessional component of financing available to sits uh, will increase substantially because it is not an overall very big increase. These are small amounts in the scheme of things, uh, but I think. Uh, uh, there's long, long, long miles uh, to go before there's that level of understanding. Sajinder, thank you so much. Uh, I think I think that's absolutely spot on. Uh, a much, much better understanding of the complexity and much, much better understanding of the challenges uh, and, and how to overcome them. And at the same time, also a realization, an explicit realization that actually this is entirely doable. And if you look at the scale of this in, in the larger scheme of things, then it is not it is not an insurmountable uh, challenge, but we will only overcome it uh, together. Now, I mean, as I said, time is running much too fast, but we have recorded this. This is much very much a conversation to be uh, continued. The recording of this will be uh, made 
made available. And I just should encourage everybody that have listened in today uh, to, to keep your engagement uh, going. We're only going to make this change uh, together. Now, one of those that are going to be able uh, to make this change and who is, is doing it is our next people who's going to uh, help us uh, close off today. And that's uh, Adriana Dino, the, the Deputy Assistant Administrator and Deputy Director in the Bureau for Program and Policy Support at, at UNDP. Now, and it is UNDP's business to do some of the things uh, to try to overcome some of the challenges that we've talked uh, about here today in terms of actually capacitating uh, small island developing states governments, uh, uh, helping uh, to uh, to ease or simplify, as Paul said, the regulatory uh, environment. But uh, but Adriana, uh, the floor is uh, the floor is yours. Uh, we look forward to hearing your, your closing uh, remarks before we will close off uh, for today. Thanks. Thank you so much, um, uh, Martin, um, uh, Excellencies, distinguished guests. Uh, thank you to our hosts, uh, the Climate Investment Platform and uh, the Alliance of Small Island States uh, and to our panelists and uh, Ambassador Herman for moderating this uh, engaging uh, discussion. Uh, as always, I learn a lot uh, uh, from uh, listening to the panelists and I would like indeed to have uh, uh, a more, um, you know, more time for, uh, uh, for discussion. So as SIDS uh, work uh, towards COVID-19 recovery and beyond, a forward-looking response can indeed realize their um, energy transition through investments in sustainable energy, which can also build resilience to future shocks. Now, while declining uh, costs of renewable energy and uh, energy efficiency technologies has opened the door for new opportunities towards energy access and towards just transition, this, uh, the unique challenges faced by the SIDS uh, pose barrier to investments. So the dispersed na nature of, uh, of SIDS, the high cost of electricity and often poor credit rating of the state-owned uh, utilities are uh, some of the challenges that we heard today from all the panelists. Um, through the climate investment platform, UNDP is uh, helping to address some of these challenges together with the Sustainable Energy for All, with the IRENA and the Green Climate Fund. We recently launched a call for proposals in the SIDS to really help catalyze uh, finance for energy investments. And um, um, the platform is currently supporting Sao Tom and Princip, uh, Vanuatu and, uh, uh, and Comoros. Uh, but I wanna say that partnerships such as the Climate Investment Platform are critical for mo mobilizing finance to achieve the energy access and energy transition goals. They are also uh, critical implementation tools uh, towards uh, realizing the recommendations on um, energy access uh, that were recently announced by the UN as part of the proposed global roadmap to achieve clean, affordable energy for all by 2030 and uh, net zero emissions by, uh, by 2050. Um, our portfolio or energy portfolio also powers, helps power this 2030 agenda by prioritizing energy access for those uh, furthest behind. In fact, by um, uh, looking at tackling the last mile first. So in 2020, uh, our portfolio and the implementation in SIDS amounted to um, around $1.5 billion in grant funding, of which 192 million were specifically on um, energy, access to energy and um, um, energy transition. So through our network of country offices, we are present in all um, uh, SIDS. We are uh, supporting governments in uh, creating the enabling de-risking policy measures, uh, hopefully with the aim to simplify, Paul, um, to further develop and uh, deploy uh, uh, renewable um, um, energy. Um, but we cannot this, do this alone. Um, so we need the commitment from each one of you, from the governments to multilaterals, to the private sector, to really accelerate this clean energy transition and um, uh, in SIDS and achieve also the SDG 7 as an enabler for all SDGs, because this is now more critical than um, ever. So thank you very much for, uh, uh, for an interesting uh, panel discussions. Over to you, Martin. 
thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Adriana, uh, for closing us off uh, on, on this uh, on this post note, saying that actually things are indeed uh, moving ahead. It's clear there's still there's still a long way to go, and and there is still sort of a sense of urgency around what needs to uh, what needs to be done. As I said, this is very much a conversation uh, to be continued. This is very much uh, work in in progress. I suppose the part of part of the solution here is trying to blend. Uh, things that we already have at our disposal, but try to blend them in new ways that are much more tailor-made to not only the needs of, of uh, the energy transition, but also the specific, specific needs and challenges of small island uh, developing states. Now, blending finance uh, tools and blending technical assistance tools is, is, is one of the ways of, of doing it. But I suppose at the end of the day, what we need are blended partnerships blending competences, blending experiences, uh, uh, so that we are able to produce, if you like, the right, uh, the right, the right cocktails uh, for uh, for for advancing this agenda. Uh, I want to thank uh, especially uh, all the panelists uh, to UNDP, the climate investment uh, platform that have organized uh, this. As Adriana mentioned, uh, a call for proposals specifically targeted uh, at small island developing states have just gone uh, out. I think a key part of this, uh, a key part of this important journey, is to is to get on with it and to learn uh, as we to learn as we go along, uh, be ready to uh, adapt, uh, be ready to adjust the uh, course uh, based on the inputs and experiences that we gain, whether we are international financial institutions, whether we are, if you like, uh, part of the uh, ecosystem of international uh, support that Adriana, Satyendra, and myself are part of, whether we are. Our governments uh, like uh, like Charles, or whether we are the entrepreneurs that are going to make uh, things happen, that are going to to switch on, if you like, to switch on uh, the light uh, like uh, Paul. So, so thank you to uh, to all of you for a really really interesting uh, perspective. As I said, a conversation uh, to be uh, very much uh, continued. And with that, uh, I wish you a, a very good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening, depending on exactly where in the world uh, you are. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ambassador Herman, for moderating this engaging dialogue. As an energy champion, Denmark has been leading energy action and is also a donor to the Climate Investment Platform. Thank you for channeling finance to enable energy transition. That brings our event to a close. On behalf of the Climate Investment Platform, I'd like to thank our panelists, Ambassador Herman, Deputy Director Dinu, and all of you for making the time to join us today. I know for some of you, it is very late at night and for others, it was very early. So your participation is much appreciated. Today is only the midpoint of the high level dialogue known as Serial Forum. So please engage with the other side events and participate in the forum. We will be making the recording of the panel available to watch on demand, so, so stay tuned for that. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>